This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shin. For people with autism, life can be a bit challenging. They often need more support than their neurotypical peers on everything from social skills to transportation. Autistic children get that support through school and the pediatric healthcare system, but support looks different in adulthood. In Connecticut, autistic adults 22 and older can apply to receive autism, the, the autism waiver. The autism waiver provides financial support to autistic adults. Last year, state lawmakers passed a bill to extend the amount of people accepted into this program, but the wait list is still long, leaving many scrambling for services. Today, we learn more about this program. And to start, we're going to hear from Emma McKeever and Pam McKeever, a daughter and mother from Glastonbury. Emma is 26 years old and autistic. She says she'll be on the wait list for another six years before she can get services from the state. Our senior producer, Tess Terrible, spoke to Emma and Pam about their experience. So um, Emma is uh, one of four Um, siblings. She has a sister and two brothers, and she's 26 years old. And she was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum when she was in middle school. She was in seventh grade. And she does a lot of things. She volunteers in the community. And she she's working hard to get a paid job. It's something that's been hard for her to do without a job coach with her at all times. What are some of your interests, Emma? I'm kind of curious because your mom said you're looking for a job. So I'm kind of curious about what you like to do and that sort of thing. Uh, My interests are um, uh, art related or um, I can also do organizing, like um, organizing in a way um, but things could look really good. Pam, you said that the diagnosis came in middle school. So kind of a question for you both, maybe, and I can start with you. When did you kind of realize that maybe you needed some extra help or things weren't you, you were a little bit different than your peers? What did that look for like for you? And then Pam, I want to hear more from you as well. Well, I just, um, as I grew older, um, I realized that um, I um, was just a bit different from most other people um, in that um, I had some talents and some struggles, um, just things that have to be worked on. I needed to make more friends and well, I can be really friendly myself, but um, the thing is, I don't really uh, prefer to do small talk because it it just um, seems a little boring to me. I like to skip to the interesting. It became clearer and clearer that making friends was difficult and using good judgment um, about maybe what you're going to say in groups like that. Yeah. You know, became a little challenging. And also, um, sometimes that could actually be a bit dangerous, um, like misjudging someone Yeah. and trying to be helpful when that someone uh, probably doesn't have really good intentions so sometimes yeah you are very trusting even with people that you may not know who might have different intentions yeah right so that was also I think there was this uh, naive side that um, was extreme and different than people her own age So, Emma, you're 26 now, so that's about, that's almost 15 years since your first, your your diagnosis. What does your your day-to-day look like now, and have things gotten easier since you've gotten that diagnosis, and was able to, you know, get Um, support? Well, I'm labeled as autistic now, Uh, so 
that probably gives me a few um, opportunities or a few helping boosts. Well, the services that she can get really since she um, graduated um, and turned 21 at the time really have decreased tremendously, although people are trying um, to get her, um, you know, employed with a a job coach through BRS. Mm -hmm. It's still very difficult because a job coach would be just for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we fill her time by having her volunteer in the community. But overall, her days are spent a lot of times alone. Um, she's on a computer and then the two afternoons a week, she'll go and volunteer in the cafe. I just need a bit more space in my life. A little bit more structure. Transportation is a big, such a big issue. Um, it's expensive and, um, sometimes, you know, it's just hard to get, um, to where you want to go, even if it's just to, you know, see, um, to go to a social skills group in person or to do grocery shopping. So transportation has been difficult. Um, Just not having that job coach available so that we could find a job that matches a lot of Emma's skills. Um, It's been hard to find businesses that want to participate in a customized employment arrangement where Emma's skills um, and strengths are um, the focus and the things that she doesn't do well would, um, you know, would not be part of her job description. So that's been, that's been difficult. Um, And yeah, just even, you know, what, and um, maybe eats in a day it would help to have uh, some nutritional mm-hmm. consultation at times because yeah. that can get a little tricky. Pam, you mentioned that once she when Sam is her 21, those services drastically decrease. Can you expand on that a little bit? Because I, I don't know if all of our listeners will be as familiar with like what the services look pre and post 21 years old. So before uh, she turned 21, she was going to a post-grad program five days a week during the school year uh, from 7.30 until 2. Um, and, she, and she would have speech services there, and um, she would have some folk ed and, um, you know, just life skills in general. After she turned 21, those services were um, just cut and she was home and she has been home um, without any real, um, partly it's because her IQ is above 70 and that changes the criteria in our state right now for the types of services that she would qualify for. Um, but we we are excited about the autism waiver program, and she, in fact, is on the wait list for the waiver. Um, and some of the things that I spoke about earlier that could really benefit Emma are um, parts of are things that are on the waiver, like the job coaching and social skills groups and yeah. um, non-medical transportation. So we're excited about that. She was put on the wait list in 2020. And I know they're servicing right now um, people who were put on the wait list in 2014. So we have a while to go. But it's um, it's that one piece of hope that we have right now for getting her more services. I think I heard that uh, there's a lot more people uh, waiting um, on the wait list, then there are people already uh, getting their their services. So this getting this waiver means that you guys would get a lot of financial support from the state to get some of these services. What are you doing in the meantime? Or are you able to do that? You're, I know that's a bit of a personal question, but are you able to have services you pay for out of pocket or what does that look like? So the social skills group that she attends, we 
weekly and um, any therapies or medical appointments, um, all of that is right now through private insurance um, or out of pocket if insurance doesn't cover. Um, we're lucky that she's able to volunteer yeah, because we don't have to pay anyone for that. And they actually have a community mentor with her there during um, her volunteer um, job. And then uh, we do use a service for transportation within our town uh, that is free. That is another gift that we have. We are just super, we've been creative and our community has been generous, but yeah. it's taken years to figure that out. Last year, when this bill was passed, extend, expanding, you know, the wait list and expanding the amount of people that could get the services. What did you all think about that? Um, because I know they've expanded services quite a bit, but there's still a bit a long way to go. Well, um, what I thought about, I went back to make sure I was correct. And I read the last uh, meeting minutes of the um Autism Spectrum Disability Advisory Council minutes just to see um, the number of people on the uh, wait list for the autism waiver, how many are being fully serviced. And then there are um, another portion who are assigned like caseworkers. So they're getting partial um, services. Um, and unfortunately, it was just as upsetting as I thought it would be in that the way I calculate the numbers, 11% of, were, are, of, of the people on the autism waiver list, over 2,000, um, were getting services. Another 5% were getting partial services. But the really scary thing to me is the 84% are, are not getting services at all. Emma is one of them. And um, it just, for me, um, I would just encourage our legislators to take a look at that um, mm -hmm. and, and see if they could figure out a way financially to just eliminate the wait list so that um, people like Emma could get the services that they need right now and not yeah. have to wait for some unknown amount of time. Yeah, and um, if uh, people like me uh, get those uh, services sooner, then um, our community could uh, definitely um, get a lot better and more colorful. And it's very concerning to live in a state with um in a wealthy state and to not have funding for um people like emma is there any estimation of when you all would receive services i know you said you joined the wait list in 2020 so um that's that's an interesting question when i contacted the department of social services to ask that i was told that i needed to file a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, so uh, I did, and after a little bit of back and forth, I was pointed to the meeting minutes that um, I was just uh, speaking about. What I know is they're servicing people um, who went on the wait list in 2014. Emma went on the wait list in 2020. So I would say that, you know, she's at least six years out. Um, yeah. And they're they're trying to reduce that number and add more and more clients mm -hmm. um, to, you know, the, to get them on the waiver and get them full services. But it just um, it just seems like we should be able to eliminate that uh, that entire wait list. Yeah, or at least really, really cut that down and uh, speed things up. Mm -hmm. So how does that make you both feel that it it could be up to six years? That's a long time to wait. Well, it makes me upset. I, I feel like it's more of a social justice argument. Um, people who have similar disabilities should be able to get similar benefits yeah. regardless of 
a wait list or not, there's a, a moral issue here mm-hmm. at stake that, um, you know, people with the same disorders should get the same benefits. It, it just feels like some, you know, got to the front of the line quicker than others. And now a lot of people with autism don't have services at all. And any of the solutions that I've heard about all will take time, all will take years. And for some, I don't know that we have those years, you know, to just waste because that's what it feels like. Yeah. We have been waiting like some years already. I want to, um, I I just want to um regain motivation and um some direction in my life. Like I'm not depressed or anything, but I just kind of feel like things are a bit stale. Um I really don't know uh what would um happen in the future or what I would be like like if I um were to be at TJ Maxx or um in some studio um or some other um area or if I'm just still at home not doing much. I really hope in six years I'm not like this. You just heard from Emma McKeever and Pam McKeever, who's a daughter and mother from Glastonbury. Emma is a 26-year-old autistic adult who's currently on the wait list for the waiver for persons with autism. We also spoke to the Department of Development Services, and they confirmed that there are over 2,000 people on the wait list for the waiver. Coming up next, we hear from someone from the Autism Advisory Council. You can also join the conversation, 888-720-9677, or leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. April is Autism Acceptance Month. Today, we're talking about the waiver for persons with autism. It's a service provided to autistic adults over the age of 22 here in Connecticut. And it can help them receive services like job coaching, social skills groups, and in some cases, live-in companions. Joining us now to tell us more is Jemna Miller. She's a co-chair of the Autism Advisory Council and a volunteer. Thank you so much for joining us, Jemna. Thanks very much, Catherine. Happy to be here. And also with us is Jennifer Twachman Bassett, who is an autism clinical specialist and research coordinator for Connecticut Children's. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for being with us today as well. Thank you very much for having me. So, Jemna, before we talk about the waiver, can you respond to what we heard from Emma and Pam because you've been following the conversation? Yeah, happy to. The The situation that they both described is, is absolutely accurate for many, many families in Connecticut with um, individuals and, and caregivers taking care of, of young adults, you know, after age um, 21 and 22, when they're out of the educational system, and now they're faced with trying to find structure and, and services and social opportunities for, you know, their, their young adults that, that need to lead a, a meaningful life. And so that's where, you know, we wanted to, um, as part of the legislation that was passed, that's really where this precipitated from. We need to be able to provide as a state those that structure and those opportunities for growth and, and, and meaningful purpose. And so we've been talking about this waiver, Gemna. Can you give us an idea of of the benefits and who's eligible to receive the waiver and how it's it's actually quite a bit different than other disability benefits that people can receive? Yes, happy to. So under the DDS waiver, uh, excuse me, DSS waiver for, for autism, 
Um, that's where we we see things like the job coaching. We see things like, um, you know, employment opportunities. And we also will be looking at uh, transportation, um, you know, services um, ongoing, as, as Emma mentioned, for, for speech and some just ongoing supports um, would be covered under the waiver. And I think part of the waiver, too, sounds like IQ qualification is really important here. Can you talk about that as well? Sure. So in Connecticut, there are a number of waivers and the autism waiver um, today, as it stands, has been for individuals that are um, with an IQ of 70 or higher. And there would be another waiver, for example, for those with a lower IQ that may be able to receive services under um, a different waiver for intellectual disability. So th this is where, you know, the, the public act that was passed, we're starting to to the council will receive results of a survey that will be examining, you know, what are those opportunities if the for eligibility if we if we do change, um, you know, that IQ requirement um, and what that impact would be, um, assessing level of need and so forth. And so, both DDS and DSS would be returning those survey results to the council as, you know. Um, multifaceted um, uh, representatives from many agencies report report to the council their findings. So we'll be looking forward to seeing those results. And then we need recommendations. We need um, the community to to partake in in giving us their voice so that you know we can we can affect change for this population. And Jennifer, I want to bring you in here. You were also following the conversation earlier. You know anything that jumped out to you that you'd like to share? Uh, yes, um, I think Emma described autism beautifully by talking about talents and struggles. And that is exactly what we see, especially in the population of people with autism that do have an IQ greater than 70. And it's going to be very important for us to find a way to really capitalize on those talents because they are untapped resources that can be of great help to the community across many different um, business and job um, employment uh, opportunities that people might have. And, um, but yet in order to tap into those, the support is extremely important. You know, Emma talked about her talents of organizing and talked about um, a high level of focus. And those are skills that can be of great use to any employer. And I think we just need to find those ways to provide the support um, because once the resources are sort of out there and available, I think that um, businesses will benefit greatly and the community will benefit as well. And, you know, as as more people know about this and conversations are happening, you know, we know there's a lot of stigma about autism and what life with autism can look like. You know, Jennifer, what do you want our listeners to know about autism and take away from this conversation today? Well, I think autism is, there's a, a wide variety um, of all along the spectrum of ability levels, of language levels, and yes, of cognitive levels as well. But what we see in autism are is people with autism have a different way of looking at the world. They have a different perspective. And that perspective can bring a great deal um, to our world. So these are outside of the box thinkers. And that type of thinking is essential to problem solving. I think it's important for us to be looking at these different viewpoints. I mean, that is really the essence of DEI mm -hmm. is being having those different viewpoints as part of a conversation on whatever issues that we have. And, and Jemna, I want to ask you the same question too. You know, what do you hope our listeners can take away from this conversation today, especially as we're talking about the waiver and, and learning that there are so many people still on that wait list? Well, I would totally echo Jennifer's, you know, comments. We we do see such a wide it's it's a spectrum disorder, and you know, with 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 that comes great opportunity for the community and for local businesses to tap into that as a as as a resource. But also, you know, it's reciprocal, right? We're giving individuals within the state that want to work that need this structure. We really see an opportunity for the community to to also um, assist in that 
And so, you know, while the the waiver is first come, you know, first come, first serve, and additional slots have been added and, and will continue to be added, you know, we we do need at this at the state level, we need funding to expand this to make sure that the individuals when they do come up on the and their number is up, if you will, for the for their slot, that we do have these supports. And so it does ha- it's a two-way street. We not only need um, more slots, but we also need the community and businesses to to support these this population. And here we're going to take a quick call from Brian, who's calling in from Long Island. Brian, you're on the air. And you've got about 30 seconds. Hi. Um, yeah, former um, special education public school teacher here, uh, taught a lot with the uh, uh, population of autistic students. Uh, my students would probably not qualify for your waiver. They're at the level of their um, cognitive and sensory challenges would be too great. However, my point, the, what I want to share with you, and uh, I think everybody knows this, is that our politicians, our elected officials, our government pay a lot, a lot of lip service to, you know, strengthening American families. And yet there never seems to be any money for the families that I served, whose their child autism was just one thing in a long list of challenges that they had. So, not only helping the, the person with autism, but the whole family and, and the political will and the political uh, uh, finances to to address that. And it seems nowhere to be found. Well, thank you so much for that call, Brian, and for taking the time and sharing your story with us. Do want to also mention that we did get a call from uh, State Senator Lisa Seminara, who shared with us that it's time to celebrate people with autism and advocate for greater inclusion and accessibility. Thank you so much, Senator, for sharing that with us. And you've been listening to Jemna Miller, who's a co-chair of the Autism Advisory Council, and Jennifer Talkman Bassett, with who is an autism clinical specialist with Connecticut Children. Thank you both so much for being here today. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. And thank you. And also a quick reminder that Connecticut Public is having its spring pledge drive. Consider supporting where we live and all of your favorite programming with a donation. And here's two of my colleagues to tell you more. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. This hour, we're hearing about the experiences of autistic adults here in Connecticut. Across the state, some businesses are working to accommodate neurodiverse customers and others in the disability community. And joining us now is someone helping those businesses. We have with us is Sarah Spear, who is the CEO and founder of Empowered Together. Sarah, welcome to where we live today. Thank you, Catherine. And for our callers, uh, give us a call, 888-720-9677, or leave us a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So, Sarah, can you start off by sharing with us, you know, what exactly does Empower Together do and how do you work with businesses? Empower Together is an online marketplace that connects people with disabilities and their caregivers to accessible businesses. So what we do is go into businesses and measure their accessibility based on ADA standards as well as standards that have been informed by neurodivergent individuals. And we sell those reports to companies if they would like them. We also list the businesses on our marketplace for free once they have been assessed for their accessibility. And businesses can also sponsor the marketplace. And then users who may be individuals living with disabilities, neurodivergent individuals, and caregivers can go on to that marketplace and find accessible businesses that meet their needs. And so you help businesses make these wide arrays of accommodations. And and today, of course, we're focusing on autism. You know, what does making accommodations for the neurodiverse population look like today? 
I want to back up and just say that I came to this work as a caregiver mm -hmm. of an individual who is autistic. She also has a developmental, other developmental disabilities related to a rare genetic disease. And what I was seeing was we would go into spaces and it was very hard to find businesses that could meet the unique needs that we had, although I realized that we weren't all alone. As I was right. talking with other caregivers, I realized there was a need to find businesses that are accepting, welcoming, inclusive and so the businesses that have really risen to the top are businesses that train their employees on disability, on neurodiversity, that employ people who are neurodivergent, who really care about this in the environment that they set, which could also include the sensory environment. So maybe there is an area with dim lighting. Maybe there is an area with... Uh, lower noise levels. And they're just thinking about these things as well as, hey, if an individual has a meltdown, people don't freak out. Mm -hmm. They give space, they ask how they can help, and they're welcoming in the way that we would want to be, even if we were in somebody's home and that same thing happened. Right. And those sound like they're little things, but they're actually very big, right? You know, I thought it's not something that I think people really think about. Um, and can you talk about, too, you know, what do those conversations with businesses typically look like? Um, you know, are they open to making these accommodations? Are they happy to? Are they surprised that these are accommodations that maybe we should start thinking more about? I've been so wonderfully surprised by how uh, inviting business owners have been. I wasn't quite sure because especially we're approaching this from standards set by the Americans with Disabilities Act as well as standards informed by neurodivergent individuals. I think people tend to hear Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA and they as business owners get scared. They are concerned that somebody's going to try to shut down their business and rather this is a, a conversation that invites them to the table to understand to dispel some of these myths. and. Um, even as simple as going into a store and there are two different audio inputs. So this part of the store has music playing. This part of the store has a TV showing a movie with a separate audio. And raising awareness of a business owner of how that can be really dysregulating to a customer coming in was so simple. And it doesn't cost that business owner any money to change and yet makes the environment so much more accessible to an individual um, who, for whom those two different audio inputs would become dysregulated. So I want to take a quick call from Kara, who's calling from Hartford. Kara, you are on the air. Hi, thanks for having me. Go um, ahead. I just wanted to make a comment. I have a similar um situation as Emma and Pam in that I am the parent of a 26-year-old um, higher functioning autistic adult who um, is still living with me at home and who has, again, was diagnosed in middle school. Um, and then once he was out of his uh, our educational system, had less access to supports. But I think an important part as we're talking about employment is that among this population of autistic adults, the unemployment rate is 90%. And so that is a concern for their parents in terms of their future uh, and ability to financially support themselves, but also I think for society in general, because at some point who is supporting these, these um, adults who are not gainfully employed and able to support themselves. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, Kara, um, and very on point with what we we're talking about just now, right? Um, uh, can you respond to what we just heard from Kara? Is that something that you're hearing that you're familiar with? Sure, absolutely. It's something that I'm hearing. And I also volunteer on our local school board. And this is something that is very front and center of how do we offer a transition program that's going to truly resource students to meet the needs as employees when they go out into the workforce. So that's close to my heart. I think that that's an important thing that we as society and as a public need to be taking on, um, that we're preparing students to exit and to lead meaningful lives employed in their communities, I think should be a big part of that um, where it's possible. And, you know, we're talking about employment here. What else, what do we know about the purchasing power of the disability community? Right. So shifting back to Empowered Together is taking a market-based approach to one aspect of all of the immense needs that we've been hearing about so far in this program. And as we look across America, there are 66 million Americans living with disabilities holding $490 billion in purchasing power. 
So as a simple example, when we want to go celebrate my daughter's birthday, she's telling me where she wants to go. She wants to go to Comstock Ferry <laughs> in Weathersfield because there's a quiet place where we can be. There's mm-hmm. natural lighting, mm-hmm. not harsh overhead lighting. She can move around and have space and not be interrupting other people. So even as a caregiver, I'm spending my money in the place that my autistic da- daughter is designating that I spend that money. Um, that's true as well for adults that are holding this purchasing power of $490 billion across our country. And I want business owners to recognize that they may not be serving these customers if they're not accessible to these customers. And, you know, you you mentioned your daughter who is also diagnosed with with autism. You know, can you can you expand more on that personal experience? You know, how does that really, how does that inform you with, with what you're doing today? Yeah. Well, first I'll pause because we've heard from a, a couple parents, Pam yes. and Glastonbury, Kara and Hartford. And I just want to say, this is hard and you're doing a great job. And I think as caregivers, we often don't get to hear that message. Right, right. And so as I have a platform to share that, uh, if you're listening today, I, I hope that in some way you can be encouraged to know you are doing the absolute best you can. I have no doubt of that. And so uh, my personal experience is that it has been hard, but then it's also been joyous. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about coming into the kitchen the other day, and my daughter is in fourth grade. She's preparing for her school's musical performance. And so she had asked Echo to play the song and she had her paper in front of her and she was practicing. And it just was such a beautiful moment that I thought, ah, I don't know. Other parents have whatever that beautiful moment is for them where they're like, I am just so grateful that this Mm -hmm. child is mine. Right. And um, so I also try to keep an ongoing memory of those moments to go back to in the hard times. Right. And, and I, I thank you so much for sharing that, because I think we when we share these stories, oftentimes for, for good reason, you know, we share about the trauma, we share about the challenges and the difficulties, but we forget that there's joy here as well. And, and I was sharing with Sarah earlier that earlier in my career, I've done a lot of stories related to autism and I saw mostly joy. I worked with a lot of kids and they were just happy to talk with me, happy to spend time with me when in fact it was my honor really, my privilege to be able to speak with with these children and, and you know and be with with empowered together, you know, we there are so many ways you could be encouraging businesses to to make more accommodations, right, including through legal legal means. Can you talk about why you're taking your approach to partner with these businesses rather than going through that route? Yeah, we're hearing today about legislative approaches to addressing needs that we have in our community. Like I said, we're taking a market-based approach Mm -hmm. and recognizing that people with disabilities, including neurodivergent individuals, have money to spend. 80% of consumers with disabilities say that their customer experiences are failures. Mm -hmm. So if 80% are failures, we have a great opportunity there to welcome business owners into the conversation and enable them to see how they can make small changes to improve the situation for everybody. And hey, if it's something as simple as lowering the lighting, that might help a mom with a young child who right. is trying to take a nap as right. she's gra- gab- grabbing lunch or something like that. And soft lighting is always comfortable, right? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're fans of soft lighting here as well. And, you know, we've been talking about how businesses have reacted. What about the newer diverse community individuals? You know, are you hearing from them? What are they think? How would they think about what's going on here? Yeah, as we think about accessibility, and I think back to the Americans with Disabilities Act that was passed in 1991, and it, there was such a focus on um, visual disabilities. And so what I'm hearing, for example, from the New Haven Commission on Disabilities that has been a thought partner as I pilot this in New Haven is that we really do need to be thinking about what sometimes are termed invisible disabilities, meaning mm. you look at an individual and you don't know just by looking at them that they have a disability. Right. And so there's been a lot of encouragement from that community because we're seeing a growth at the very least in diagnosis of autism and other um, developmental disabilities. So I think it's imperative on us as a community to then see how can we include everyone that we know is a part of our community in meaningful ways. So we've got about a minute left here, but would love for you to share some final thoughts of, you know, what do you hope our listeners uh, take away from this conversation today? 
Yeah. If you're a person with autism, I invite you to check out Empower Together and we want to be a place for you. You are a person who has inherent value and dignity and Empower Together invites you to come to come into community, be included. Um, and I invite everybody else who's listening to be part of building that inclusive community that we all want to live in. That's what I want to live in with my kids. And that's why I'm building this. Well, thank you so much. You've been listening to Sarah Spear, who's the CEO and founder of Empowered Together. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and your personal stories with us today. Thanks, Catherine. And just a quick reminder that we are in our spring pledge. Consider supporting Where We Live and all of your favorite shows with a donation. You're going to hear a little bit more about how to do that from two of my colleagues in a little bit. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Tess Terrible. Our technical producer is Dylan Reyes. Download Where We Live anytime on your favorite podcast app. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you.